so with that, um, I don't think she needs much introduction, but let's uh, welcome Dr. Young. So we realized a couple of months ago that by November 12th of this year on 2014, we would see uh, an important point in the conservation of Gunnison sage grouse in terms of a, a decision about whether it will be listed as endangered, endangered or threatened or not listed at all. And really it's a longer 15 to 20 year story behind that, but we realized there was an intersection between the science of environmental management and thinking about all the policies that you guys have recently been looking at, including the ESA. So the talk today is really trying to talk about both, thinking about habitat, Habitat Protection and the Endangered Species Act. Probably could have subtitled this Sex, Violence, Deception, and Politics, right? And uh, I'm gonna start right now with a little bit about sex and violence. And I start with a picture of me, so that's really scary. As many of you know from a little bit of a talk I gave about resources in 601 and the one field trip, is that I was interested in sage grouse beginning as an undergraduate working in the Sierra Nevadas, and then eventually I came to Purdue University and did my PhD research on Gunnison sage grouse from 1988 through 1994 with much longer hair, much, much younger and all those type of things as well. And for my PhD study, the people that I was working with in the Sierra Nevadas had received a cassette tape by a PhD student that was working on winter habitat and physiological things of the Gunnison sage grouse and he said, hey, I think these sound different. And I had been working in the field for three seasons and working in a sound lab, and I put the tape on and I, I listened to it, and I talked my advisor into loaning me some uh, equipment, and my mom into uh, driving out with me in a van again, and my dad into building me a blind. And in my last semester as an undergrad, I looked at the Gunnison sage grouse and thought, whoa, they are really, really different. And my background was all very theoretical about behavioral biology and evolution, and I was curious about how, and I'll explain in a second, their unique mating system could have maybe caused some of the differences. I had none of the background that you will have after two years. No signs of environmental management, or bigger picture views about policy, or thinking about integrated skills, probably not very many good um, personal communication skills or any of those things as well. So I was just the classic sort of PhD student, curious in behavior, especially in mating systems. Okay, so that's where the story starts. And I came out to Gunnison, and it's a rather chilly place to study, uh, study things in the springs. And the sage grouse in Gunnison and all over North America, they were in 13 different states and two Canadian provinces at that time, hundreds of thousands of them spread across the West. All of them have what's called a lek mating system, which is kind of a unique type of mating system in which, uh, unlike monogamy in birds, which is the most common, where a male and a female raise young together, and they usually pair for at least a season, are polygyny, where one male may mate with a few females, um, but still maybe provide a little bit of resources, like nest sites or food for the young. In a lek mating system, it's the rarest mating system, the males will gather in spring like this. The rotten, rotten males will gather about an hour before dawn, and if you're trying to study behavior, you want, of course, not to interfere with them, so you go out into to blind you bin about two hours before dawn. Whatever recording equipment you've set up, whatever things you're doing, you know, you're all doing it at about 3.30 in the morning. It's freezing cold out there. You may have had to walk through three miles of mud and snow and slush, so forth, to get to them. What the males are doing is that they're gathering on wide open spaces that we call lex, which is a Swedish word to play. So it's both the ground that they're on as well as a name for the mating season or system. And they fight for territories. These are all adult males out here that smack each other with wings. This is the violence part. It's really fun to watch them march. They beat each other up. And eventually they have small territories, maybe about four or five meters around me might be one. And then the male would be next to them, the male next to them. They get that all established. And then the females meander in about two or three weeks later. And there's no, no forced copulations. It's all female mate choice. They look at males across several days and across several mating grounds. They'll eventually, after checking them out, um, go back to a single male. They'll mate. And the only thing that the male will contribute to the female is sperm. They don't help them raise the young in any way. Okay, so this is all driven by female mate choice. The characteristics that the male can show of their vigor 
are considered to be genetic con characteristics that the females are looking at, trying to think about, in a sense, they don't think consciously about this, but evolutionary, they've been driven to pick males that are highly vigorous, very dominant on the lex, may have certain um, characteristics of their air sacs that they're popping wildly, a sound you can hear up to a mile away. And so very few, the females will check all the males out. In the end, only 10 or 15% of the males out of all the population is going to mate. Okay, so that's another characteristic. They provide nothing but sperm, no resources, no food, no parental care later. After they mate, the relationship's over, the female wags her butt, basically, if the mating is successful. If not, they do it again. Then she takes off and she, she finds a nest site, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So very, very interesting mating system, and it has some, some consequences because of that. When you have only 10 or 15% of the males mate, and on any given lex, and there are lex in the Gunnison Basin in the 1950s that had over 500 males on them, okay? There were lex when I first started here that had over 100 males on them. There were lex in the 80s with over 300. Usually one or two males, not just 10 or 15%, but one or two males account for 80 or 90% of all the matings in a given lek. So a couple are really successful. We have some ideas of what the females are choosing from other behavioral studies, and this was part, remember, I was, I was all theoretical. I was curious about all these type of things. And I was curious about if just a few males are being chosen, then the daughters will inherit, and we now know that female mating preferences are genetic. They'll inherit their mother's preferences for those male traits, and the sons will inherit the traits themselves. So you can have pretty rapid evolution of differences between both males and females as well as potentially rapid evolution if that population is in isolation of one distinct segment of that species from another. Does that make sense? So very few are be mating, so those traits will disproportionately. So imagine that the, the male is particularly white in the chest. Over time, since the daughters and the sons the sons will inherit a wider chest. The daughters will inherit preferences for wider chest. White chest will become very, very popular. Body size could. Lengths of their, their neck feathers or, their, or, or of their tail feathers, the colors or stripes on them. Whatever the, the preference was, it might have been an indicator of their, of their strong and good genes, their um, resistance to disease, whatever it might be. All those things are going to rapidly evolve. So in left main systems, you might see some some divergence and more rapid evolution, and that's what I was curious about. And whether those things in the end were significant enough in behavior and physically, and if there was enough genetic differences, that they might be actual mating barriers. And at some point, if the mating barriers are, are significant, we start to recognize that it may be a different species. That came later. I was mainly curious about this for the first couple of years. But the more I was studying things, the more different parts of the research and playback experiments and capturing birds and studying them was suggesting that things were, were for, pretty developed in this population of sage grouse of all these hundreds of thousands of birds across the western part of North America. So basically, that's what I was focused on. I hadn't thought very much about something that's kind of in gray here. When you have this going on, you have very few males contributing genetically, you have a lack of genetic variation being passed on as well. Sometimes when there's a lack of genetic variation going on in a species, especially if it's sudden and rapid, in lecking species, it tends to be over long periods of time, but it can lead to genetic defects, to an inability to adapt to changing environments, to to rare recessive, recessives being expressed more in populations. And things like that can cause, at a population level, less individuals to survive, to breed, to live, and it could even lead, theoretically, to extinction. Wasn't thinking much about any of that. I was pretty focused on the, the sex and violence part and were they different, okay? So I'm just gonna show you a summation in two or three slides of about a decade of my life, you know? You'll have slides like this yourself later, or portfolios or pieces. And so after six years of studying and, and uh, doing detailed studies every morning, looking at, at characteristics of males and females and catching things and doing playback experiments and all the, there's lots of papers about all that, 
Bottom line was, is I was able to document, along with the help of many others, that it was a completely different mating call that was going on here in Gunnison, and, and it was the call that draws the females in, that the actual way that they make the call, and they kind of take a couple steps and go, whoop, bloop, 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 was um, at a much slower rate. They were popping these wonderful air sacs, these are males, <laughs> nine times instead of two, that they uh, were displaying at a slower rate, and that through playback experiments of successful mating males, from Wyoming, or excuse me, from Northern Colorado and from California, um, and then doing that here in Gunnison and taking Gunnison mating males, those one or two males calls, playing them back in other populations, that females appeared to stay farther away, never mate very close to the males that had the speakers in their territories, we had controls, all the things you do in science. So it looked like just on behavior alone that, these, the spe that this part of the species had diverged. And notice these papers, the dates of 1994. My PhD was done by 1994. You'll see things, think about that date, it'll be important later. Physically, we knew they were different too. The Gunnison sage grouse, about two thirds the size. And this was work that was actually started by the graduate student that sent me that tape. And other pieces of this work were completed by others too, by Jerry Hupp and Clay Braun. So they're about two thirds the size. Their, their primaries or their wing feathers are shorter, their retrices are shorter, they're different patterns, see the banding. They have these nick bioplumes that they throw over their head. So there's behavioral differences and there's very visual differences. Now it's hard to test visual differences on different populations because once um, a management agency realizes they may have something unique, they don't want you transplanting birds and trying things and so forth. But they had accidentally done that themselves. They had taken some sage grouse in Utah from northern Utah brought them down to a population in southern Utah. I found out about this in 1990, and I, one of the wildlife biologists was watching a, a video I was doing at a conference, and he said, wow, he said, we were always confused. So he said, the birds we brought down never, never mixed, and the females from our population would never mate with them. So there was a, an experiment, an accidental experiment, where birds from what we were calling at that time the northern population, which were in the other 12 or 13 states, um, that seemed pretty similar were actually transplanted into an area that turns out was Gunnison's and, and they never made it in and it, that those northern birds just disappeared is what happened ultimately with them. So physically different and then genetically different as well. Um, I was fortunate I got to participate in some looking at mitochondrial DNA, they've looked at nuclear DNA, DNA, there's been 10 years of study since these 1999 papers, and pretty much the genetics was begun in 1993 and four. We knew the answers by 1997, but we also delayed publishing, and I'll explain why. Um, but it showed that there was little gene flow between what we were calling sage grouse and Gunnison sage grouse by then. They later became called the greater sage grouse and Gunnison sage grouse. There is an extreme lack of genetic diversity in the Gunnison sage grouse, and recent studies show that as well. We first started looking at this, they had as little genetic diversity as any free-ranging population of birds that had ever been studied, okay? And, uh, and they likely diverged from this, these other birds, and we have now tested everywhere in the range. There's papers out, recent papers out, if anybody's interested in it, um, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So this is a deep divergence. This isn't something really, really new. It just was undiscovered, right? There's species all over the planet that are existing, that diverged evolutionarily a long, long time ago that we don't know about yet. So there were behaviorally different, morphologically different, and physically different, or excuse me, and genetically different. So I'm gonna take you to about 1992 where a lot of this work was in process, or almost completed, knew a lot of the answers that were emerging. And I wasn't a taxonomist, but I'd talked to taxonomists and read their papers and tried to figure out what it meant to be a subspecies or a species. And I was having breakfast with um, all the Division of Wildlife Managers from what's now called the Colorado Parks and Wildlife here in Gunnison at, at a place that's now the Double Dragon, eating my pancakes. The only girl, at the, her female at the table, and uh, we were all joking about different things and talking about things, and, and something came up where one of them said, hey, I hear that the grouse that you're studying, you think they're different. It's like, yeah, you know, and I was a total science geek. They're different behaviorally, and they're different 
physically, and we're doing some genetic studies. Yeah, they're really, really different. And he said, so you think they're, they're going to call them a subspecies? And I said, no, I, I think they're a species. And he said, no, they're not. I was like, what do you mean, no, they're not? <laughs> you know, they either are or they're not, right? That's science, right? Think about all the things you're learning that I had no clue about thinking about this moment. And he's like, no, they're not. They can't be. And I, I was still really puzzled. I was puzzled for months, if not years, after that. And I said, what do you mean? I said, whoops, excuse me. And he said, uh, you, it can't be a different species. You cannot open that can of worms. It's like, what, what can of worms are you talking about? Right? <laughs> you know, I was a behavioral ecologist and pretty excited. And I'd been studying them and the BLM, like I'd mentioned to some of you, and 601 had provided me with a truck so I could look at nesting and brew rearing and winter habitat. And, and they were so different. And he's like, no, no, you just, they can't be a different species. And that's where he stopped. Okay? He went on to become very senior in his organization. And he was actually local from an area out here. And I think he knew a lot of things that I had not yet put together about why they were a can of worms. So with that, we're going to kind of think about what did he know? Maybe, right? What was he thinking? And he'd been on the land a long time. We've looked at local information, local people. He'd spent his life in wildlife, environmental management. And he probably had a pretty good sense of what a strong indicator species sage grouse is for the shrub steppe ecosystem, OK? So as we think about annual habitat use of sage grouse, they are, they are amazing in what they tell us about the health of this ecosystem out here. So in nesting, and you know from reading a little bit, but it was kind of, somewhat hard to tell from that paper, they need these big expanses, right, of unbroken sagebrush that's away from as we found out about, away from certain human disturbances. And then within this, they put their nest. Remember, these females go alone. So they're trying to be very secretive. There's no males to protect them and so forth. It's all about camouflage. They go to the base of the sagebrush. They hollow out a little bit of a, a tiny nest in the soil. And they lay six to eight eggs. And they quietly sit on them. And they use their camouflage to try to avoid predators. So there's got to be good grass cover around it, good forbs, that type of stuff. It's got to be a place that they can quietly creep away from twice a day, fly maybe after they've walked for a quarter mile, poop for the first time, eat a little bit, come back. They actually close the one opening. They have a cloaca, which they both poop through and have sex through, right? Or birds have one opening type of thing for that type of thing. They close it off. They lower their heartbeat so they won't smell. They won't move. It's all about being quiet. And they don't nest together. It's solitary. So they've got to have healthy sagebrush, big stands, and it's all about secrecy to avoid, you know, the fate of sage grouse is to be eaten, so to, to try to avoid at that stage in life them or their eggs being eaten. So they need that. And then in brood rearing, when those chicks hatch, they're precocial. They don't need any feeding by their mom. They'll start pecking at the ground and eating invertebrates, but they do need invertebrates. They need insects. So at the nesting time, females are primarily eating sagebrush leaves, pretty much the diet of sage grouse most of the year. But during the brood rearing time, after the chicks hatch out, they're looking for invertebrates, so they need wet, mesic hot spots. We talked about this on our field trip, at least, some biodiversity hot spots in this ecosystem that have the insects, the small flowering forbs or plants that attract the insects. That is their diet. They need good cover, though, too. They need to be able to jump back into the sage. So they need that. So now they need another part of this ecosystem, right? They need the big, tall stands of sagebrush, but they need these wet areas of sagebrush adjacent, adjacent to them that are the biodiversity hotspots of this ecosystem. And then as the chicks get older, and it gets a little bit close, closer to the fall, they'll start to, as we saw on our field trip, form um, larger groups. They'll start to go back to a diet of eating sagebrush. And by winter, they're they're eating just sagebrush, which is amazing with all the toxins in it. Sagebrush is poisonous to almost all, every species that eats it. They gain weight on it. They get fat and sassy in the winter. And it's amazing, right? And so there's papers about that. They also need it for cover from winds and so forth. And they snow roost into the snow, which is not known to be done by any other sage grouse. So they need, they need some relatively, um, they had sagebrush sticking out, should be north facing, or excuse me, um, 
well, in north-facing drainages where it's high, or it's been windswept in areas on the plateaus. So they need tall sagebrush that they can access and eat, eat nutritious leaves. And then they go to these leks. And these leks are so historic. You're going to hear me talk about how they don't give up on them, even when there's incredible habitat change going on around them. The adult males that got established will keep going back, but juveniles won't get established and females won't come visit them if there's problems. But the leks are these openings. And so in a healthy ecosystem, you have stands of sagebrush, you'd have these wet areas, you'd have tall sagebrush in some places, and the natural mosaic openings, right? This would be like a very healthy ecosystem with all these components. And then what we find is when we radio track them, put collars on and so forth, they like to go back over and over and over again to the same places. Does that make sense? They're very site faithful. That's worked for hundreds of thousands of years is to move on a landscape scale 10, 20, maybe 40 or 50 miles, but to go back around to the same places for that particular bird time after time again. That's what they're, the, those birds that were doing those behaviors were selected across evolutionary time, so it's, it's hardwired in them. Predators? <laughs> yeah, so there's predators at all sorts of stages. Um, nest predators, the eggs themselves, ground squirrels, ravens are probably two of the big ones. Um, we get weasels and stuff occasionally back there. Of the nesting grouse, coyotes can take them at night on it as they come off the nest. A golden eagle can take them. Um, bobcats can certainly do it in the habitat. We get mountain lions through it, but it's not a, a big mountain lion type of corridors and so forth. Um, the little chicks are delicious to, you know, great horned owls or, or red-tailed hawks or um, some people have suggested that even ravens could be picking up the chicks before they're able to fly and so forth on there. In the winter, it's probably mainly golden eagles at that point. Almost nothing else can get to them in a sense through there. When they're on the lek, eagles love to, to strike and eat them. Um, coyotes will walk through. Seeing a coyote take a grouse on a lek, there's just, it's too open. They can just sort of, they can fly very strongly, they can get away from them. Um, I've heard of a, of, a, of a predation event or two in my lifetime as a biologist by a coyote or a bobcat. You have to be pretty darn sneaky to do it. Is that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that gives us a sense, or highly site faithful, and maybe what the, the district wildlife manager realized, is there's such a good indicator species. You know, when you have a, a bird tied that's obligate, it can't be found elsewhere, it has to be in sagebrush, and it uses all these different components of the habitat. It can, and it's, it was also a game species. We'd been counting them and measuring them and taking wings and looking at the number you can tell from a, a wing, whether it's male or female or the young of the year, and whether it was a, a female actually had a successful nest or not, because her molt pattern will change, and hunters give the wings. We have all this data on the through hunting and through people counting and so forth on sage grouse, we know almost nothing about most of the rest of the species that occupy habitats like that. So when you have a species that's tied to it, an indicator species indicates the health and whether that species goes up or down might tell you about all these other species. That is a little milk sketch, or a skiff milk vetch up there in the corner. I saw Tom really looking. Might be telling you. I had to put in a token plan and behave myself. There's a, you know, also, now we know proportionately in the ecosystem, right, these are really the, the biomass and stuff, but uh, it's really, really hard to actually look at the health of all the different species we need to. So a lot of times we'll look at indicators of the ecosystem health. That makes sense? So as we think about habitat, and we're thinking about those things, and I think, I think that he understood that, but perhaps what he understood the most um, was that there were problems in the ecosystem. You know, he had spent his life here. He came from a multi-generational family. There was discussion about how many grouse there used to be, you know, what the habitat was like and those type of things. And of course, this is a person that loved wildlife or he wouldn't have got in to the, the job he was in. So as we think about habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation, um, while I started the study just to look at the behavior to help learn more about the sage grouse and to get the resources I needed to do the study, 
I had looked at nesting and brood rearing and, and, and winter habitat was actually done by another person, by Dr. Jerry Hupp for the most part, we had some. So as long as I had my hands on birds um, to take blood for genetics and to put bands on to identify them so I could look at them individually and understand you know, the answers to the questions that I provided and we could measure them Basically, the BLM and division said, will you put radios on them and follow them? And it was through the birds that my eyes probably opened up about their habitat use and then what the challenges were. When I take someone that's never been out here and you look at the great expanses of sagebrush, it all looks okay. There's a lot of, you know, it's okay. But the birds really taught me a lot that maybe not so much. So I know for the readings, you were looking at habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. So we'll kind of use that language to go back through their annual cycle and see what some of the anthropogenic effects are. So back to the nesting cycle, they make six or eight eggs in small nest, right? During, and they need that tall, large expanses of sagebrush. Well, the, the studies that we did then and studies of the greater sage grouse, there's been lots of nesting, is that they start to give you characteristics of what makes a, a nest that was depredated and um, Tyler, you asked about that. By the shell fragments, you can usually tell what the predator was. So that gives you a hint of whether it was avian at least, you know, whether it was a ground squirrel or a weasel. The weasel will bite the, uh, a hole out of the middle and suck the chick out, whereas a ground squirrel will also kind of fragment the shells and stuff like that. And so as you look at this, um, number one, can you see the female on the successful nest? Here's her head, body. I could be as close as I am to you with a radio pointing at it, staring at the base and not see them. If the habitat was healthy, if there were tall grasses, if there were forbs around it, it'd be very, very hard to see her. But a female on this nest, it's pretty darn easy whether you're a ground squirrel or a coyote going by or whatever it might be. So habitat characteristics um, for nesting habitat are really, you know, having dense enough sagebrush away from, as you read about, roads and development, they, they are easily disturbed, and if they're flushed off their nest, they may never go back to it. If they're flushed off their lek, they're usually done for the day. So, again, this for hundreds of thousands of years, this worked for them as a safety mechanism. Not so good when there's a whole new species wandering through your environment that has a high rate of, or frequency of disturbance too. So, so anyway, um, it's really important that they have a lot of cover, that they're away from, from uh, our roads, our trails, our development, as Aldridge talked about. He also mentioned that 57% of the basin is considered crucial nesting habitat from the paper you read. Talked about females avoiding development and roads. And that's on a very broad scale. Some of the research I was doing also showed that grass height they had to be a certain height of grass on average for it to be a successful nest. There had to be the presence of those flowering um, plants to draw the insects in. Uh, for the unsuccessful nest, did you, were you able to find like the females that had unsuccessful nests, nests continue to have unsuccessful nests or did they learn to put them in more yeah. habitat? Yeah. So two answers. One is a, um, other species of grouse including lecking grouse, will normally, depending on when it happens, try to re-nest. We only had um, like one out of 39 females in the Gunnison Basin do it during my PhD period. So number one, if they lose their nest, whether it's through disturbance or predation, they're gone. Um, number two is that they will go back to the general area the next year, usually within two or 300 meters of where they were before. It may or may not be unsuccessful. Again, they won't go to the exact same bush. I'm smiling because we don't know. We have, uh, we have no real multi-generational. I had an in of one that sure looked like a mother was leading a daughter around a lek. A daughter was a year old daughter. And uh, that, that daughter ended up taking her chicks to the brood. But, so we had genetics, an in of one. We have never really looked. There's so many interesting social questions 
about social learning and of the habitat and so forth and the species that, that we actually know very, very little about. But you have to be careful because those type of studies tend to be a bit more invasive. You have to have radios on, a lot of tracking, you have to be careful about it. Some of you mentioned scientific lack harassment. That was actually put in there as a caution about research like mine, right? And you've heard me talk as a class up at Rumble about if you're going to do something that you think is going to have an impact on an individual level, better be worth it on a species level, right? And it wasn't because my practices were, were bad. It was acknowledging that science can be an impact as well as some of these other uses. Okay, on to, to brood rearing. Cute little chick moment. These are the type of areas that I was trying to describe that they love. And then, you know, this becomes some of the controversial slides in any talk, is that brood rearing habitat has been identified as probably the most limited habitat right after winter. And I'll explain why it's winter in the Gunnison Basin. Is we've had quite a strong effect on kind of mining the understory of the, of the shrub step habitat within the basin. And when you look at, for example, that Federal Re Register notice, 98% of the BLM allotments, which have 51% of all the habitat of the species, is currently grazed. And depending on which section of, of uh, science and environmental management you have, you'll realize, I've talked about, we don't, we don't have much buffer, because it's all currently grazed at different levels. And this is a dramatic photo and inappropriate. It doesn't describe most of the allotments anymore. It does describe some of the private land and some of the allotments occasionally. It has gotten better. When uh, cows first arrived in the late 1800s, there was no management. And I can only imagine what the, the landscape looked like where the, <coughs> the cattle was. By the 1950s, it was so bad that the uh, the ranchers cut the numbers in agreement with the Department of Interior by 50%. 20 years later, they cut it by another 50%. Okay? And that can make it really puzzling for them because they'll be like, well, grazing's not an issue because we have 25% of the, of the cows we have on the land that we did. But they don't realize that the cumulative impact of overgrazing by previous generations is their legacy, is one of the challenges. So grazing is still a current issue, right? Only 25%, and you can read in the Federal Register what they mean by, by land health assessments and this type of thing, and what sort of data and how that ties into what's known about the research for grass heights and forbs and sagebrush and so forth, but only 25% are either at or moving toward. And that, was, um, that stati statistic was from 2012, a long time after we realized we had problems in a sensitive species. So it's still, uh, um, and this would be an example of, without a doubt, habitat degradation, right? It's not loss, the habitat's there, but it's the quality of the habitat has dramatically changed. And it's hard to, while it's still being grazed, is to, to get it back to a point of a, you know, thinking about shifting baselines. It's not gonna be like it was 100 years ago, but it has probably a lot more potential than what we see right now. And it's hard to do while you're still managing the economic activities that are part of the, the blood and the social equity of this community. It's challenging. People have been trying for, for a long time. Roads and trails and love places like Harvard's and we talk about Signal Peak, there's a lek up here. Okay? So all these type of things cause habitat fragmentation as well as degradation, depending on what the trails do in terms of the watershed, its disturbance, the grouse are highly susceptible to physical disturbance. And then it just simply, you know, a chick moving across a place like that is that much easier for the, great horn, for the uh, golden eagle or the great horned owl or the red-tailed hawk to see, those type of things. Are, so it just, those are, those are challenges for them without a doubt. And then all the trails that we bring in and some of the activities we do bring in the disturbance that we've talked about in my two 605 classes and bring cheatgrass into the basin. We probably had a moment, an opportunity, a control. Um, but right now, it's in every BLM allotment within the basin. And in some areas of the Gunnison sage grouse range that we'll talk about, um, cheat grass is up to 30% of the dominant vegetation type in the sage grouse habitat. And as we talked about in, in my classes, what happens is the burning frequency changes 
and the sagebrush is no longer reestablished, and species that are obligate species on it, like the Gunnison sage grouse, cannot exist. So it's a huge challenge once you have the, the uh, roads and the trails and the, the opportunity for it to spread, it does. And as we talked about in my class, despite predictions, it has. So just kind of want to mention, because I think abundance is going to be important later, is um, this was a hunted species through my PhD. And through interesting community concert conversations afterwards, it's a hunted species in most of its range, the sage grouse in general. But the amount, right? This is a Kevin Alexander moment again of shifting baselines. One guy, I didn't mention in here, he was 60, let's see, yeah, 68 went out, if you know where Sapa Monero Mesa is, it's above Blue Mesa Reservoir, and he killed over 860 grouse in one day, right? So think about when you read in the newspaper, people talk about recovery. What are we recovering from and to, right? We're never gonna see that many grouse. I'm not trying to suggest we can, but just the abundance that pretty much just over a century ago I'll, you'll see in a few minutes that the entire number of adult males counted throughout the Gunnison Basin in 2014 is less than this number, 100 years later. Okay, So we had um, probably some overhunting issues. There was one population of the seven populations that actually, um, they made a mistake. It was a small population to open up the season and no grouse were found. They had to bring birds in and transplant them. And it's also physical disturbance and we'll, we'll briefly talk about how it finished here. On to winter habitat too. Um, some of the characteristics I talked about, bushes sticking above the, uh, you know, that the sage grouse can access for their food, windswept areas and so forth. Important, besides it's fun to show you the ATV picture and a uh, younger Jess. So the main issue for winter habitat is from 1970 for about 1985 is we burnt a very significant portion of it. And the targets were, as we were trying to, winter habitat were in, or in uh, mesic conditions in which grass would come back fast. And so in those drainages, for example, um, if you burn them, grass will come back in it. And our two target species for economic value in the basin were, were cows and elk. And I have actually a, a lot of empathy for the ranching community because these were our values. And for the hunting community, they're still our values. These are part of our, our heritage. They're part of the social equity issues. They're part of the way that a lot of businesses make money. So we weren't thinking about sage grouse or all the other species they might represent. We were trying to enhance those values. They were the community's values. But we lost a, a lot of habitat. So brood rearing and winter habitat are considered the limiting habitats, limiting probably the growth of of the population because of its loss, its degradation, its fragmentation, and its continued threats through development, grazing, and so forth. Well, that's a weird thing that happens sometimes on PowerPoints. So, luck breeding habitat. We'll just move right past all that sex on there. See, a little bit of sex and violence. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> so, there were about 70 active leks about 40 years ago in the Gunnison Basin. Um, they were in places like here. Anybody recognize what this might be? It was a picture from about 1964. Yep, this is the Gunnison River. For those of you that work for the National Park Service, this is about to be Blue Mesa Reservoir two years later, right? Um, there's a lek out there that quite a few of the birds would come and display on. There were probably leks that we didn't know about in those areas. Great nesting habitat for all the riparian for brood rearing, nice winter habitat in these areas. And to give you an example of how site faithful, so massive loss of habitat, right? Massive loss on that part of the valley when we flooded it. So it froze, of course, it's Gunnison. <laughs> and uh, in March, it's typically still frozen. This is before climate change. And the birds in 1966, 1967, 1968, the adult males went out and danced on the ice 60 feet above where their lek was. They are very sight faithful. So they will change some, like the, the nest. Um, when we put up a substation for electric power in Antelope Hills, they jumped the 12-foot fence and danced on the pad. 
But what happened was, is the first year you saw half, maybe three quarters of what you saw the year before, but the next year about half of that, the year after that half of that, and you don't have to be a mathematician to know within three or four years it's gone because they're not recruiting young males because the habitat's so bad in that area that females are no longer picking males in that area to mate. Young males aren't recruiting, and that part of the population, those adult males, just quit contributing to it and eventually die off and, and it's gone. So, so lek habitat can be highly susceptible to loss um, and it is kind of the center of where all the activity starts from and so we lose leks, it's a big deal. And there's development, I lived in a house, we lived in a house where there had been a lek in that area so I have sage grouse development, lek development loss in my soul and that type of thing. It was over by Hartman's Rock, Hartman Rocks out there. Development is still a huge threat if you read the listing documents. If you lose a lek, is there any chance that, maybe not the young, but the males that are on that lek, do they find new lek or is that lost? Basically not. The adult males don't. The females are probably going to go to another lek, right? Um, so you lose the adult males from that part of the population. But depending on the overall cumulative loss of them, you're starting to, uh, to lose population overall by the mating opportunities and so forth. But it's mainly adult males that are probably wiped off. And who makes it to like first? Is it the females? The males. They arrive, fight it out. Look more, they just look so mournful until the females show up. No, I'm not supposed to say things like that. I'm a behavioral biologist. But it's funny watching them. They fight and then they sit and look at each other. And then they get up and fight and then they're like, come on, you know, it's March. <laughs> They, they absolutely do. So they typically will go to three to five leks. They'll go to the same lek multiple times. They'll walk through that lek. We had uh, it gridded and we followed the track of every female. And so when we had marked ones, we could get especially good data, but we followed them whether they were marked or not. They'll revisit pretty much every territory. And then we would see some that would go on to other leks. We know from radio tracking studies, we'll come back in and then boom, within 10 minutes, suddenly mate with a male. Yep. So they're assessing. They're doing a lot of assessing. Um, and there's some studies about what male traits are correlated to female mating choice. But what that really means in terms of survival, adaptive, you know, genetics is interesting. That was the stuff that first got me involved in all this. All this conservation stuff I was confused about for a while. So habitat fragmentation, um, you may have read from the listing document, fences, power lines, big issues, right? And raptor perches, they just transplanted 16 birds over into another small population over Monarch um, Poncho Pass this last year. Four of them are dead, two of them ran into power lines. You know, so they're sign these, are, these are real issues for them. So I think thinking about the can of worms, I started to understand what the Division of Wildlife Manager that shall relate, remain nameless, he who shall not be named, no, thinking about Harry Potter, sorry. Um, I think I understand what he meant by can of worms by 1992 or so. I was four years through my PhD, still needed another season or two, writing things up, had a lot of this data figured out, thinking about the behavior things, but I had started to gather data on the lek counts of sage grouse since the 1950s. I'd been radio tracking for three or four years. I was seeing some of the impacts. And then someone handed me a project proposal for uranium male tailings. And we had a super fun site here. We had uranium male tailings that were out to the west of town by um, across the road from the airport where the, any of you have visited the county shelter for the animals, right in that area. And they were starting to seep. We had a plume that was starting to get into the water and that was gonna contaminate the water for the Dos Rios people by the golf course. So we had to move them without a doubt. So I noticed while I was out there, that there were these truck surveys and you should always be suspicious when there's like the the oil and gas sort of trucks driving around and, and little holes are being drilled <laughs> and they're testing. That was going on for the last couple of years and, and they were looking for a, a stable site, but they were also trying to do it to minimize people realizing they were moving the tail lanes because that's not good for tourism and the dust and the challenges and stuff like that. So they found a site in Chance Gulch right behind W. Madden. Okay? And they had other sites that they could have picked. In Chance Gulch, what they were going to do was they were going to take the tailings, dig a 100-foot a, um, hole, 
build a thousand by a thousand foot pit, blow up a mountain close to it or a rocky hillside so they'd get gravel to cap them with. They built a proposed building a road that was 20 feet wide, six feet raised across the ground, trucks going by every 90 seconds for a year and a half because it was a, a million tons of tailings, be done with the project in two years, cap it, put radioactive signs everywhere, call it done. So it was on BLM land, and, and uh, here's what the, the actual 1,000, you know, it's three football fields by three football fields. When I got involved was someone quietly saying, they're, they're uh, not following NEPA. And what about your sage grouse? Don't you have sage grouse out there? It was where a, a quarter to a third of all known breeding males bred was a, in a lek complex with the largest of those lek areas within a softball toss away. Okay? And uh, they decided not to do an EIS. They did an EA. So for those of you, did you do NEPA? Okay. So does this sound like a, a significant project on federal land? It's a good question. Not the BLM. So it was the Colorado Department of Health, and the final decision makers for it were the EPA, are in charge of whether they do or don't. The recommendations from agencies and the local community was not to do an EIS, so they did an EA. Okay, so it's a reduced amount. So they did something, but the EA that I saw said there would be no impact to wildlife, was the conclusion. So I was like, well, Hey, you guys know, right? Here's all the, here's the lek data and all that. And you guys have been collecting the data for 40 or 50 years, you know, and I've been kind of looking at it. And you, you realize the second largest lek in the basin, that's just, this is a quarter of, you know, and these birds are probably, they're different. <laughs> they're special, <laughs> right? You know, and they were like, you know, yeah, <laughs> um, that's nice, <laughs> you know. And then I started getting these weird messages. I was getting calls from uh, state leaders at, of, uh, the Division of Wildlife to, to, that I wasn't, if I kept going, I may lose my ability to continue my work locally, okay? And so I was like, what? I was like, this is, you know, this is kind of bad. And they're like, you know, it's a public health issue. It's down the track. It's a $2 million project. The, you know, everybody's on board. You know, shut up about the grouse. <laughs> you know, this is a hunted game species. So there's 100 males, you know, on that lek in that area, which it would be amazing to see this day. Um, you know, there's 100,000 grouse out there. This is not, you know, knock it off. And that pressure got stronger and stronger. And um, the scientific lek harassment actually came from, from someone confronting me that if I continued to talk about it, they were an officer at the Division of Wildlife and protested that they were hearing from the Colorado Health Department, I was doing much more damage on the sage grouse by actually physically being on a lek and catching them and stuff like that. And they, would ha they wanted me arrested for scientific lek harassment. So I went to, I literally, after a you know, few days of this, kind of went to bed and thought, boy, I don't want to lose the study because I think if I can publish this data, you know, maybe something big, you know, maybe this could help the birds in the future. But then you have that ethical moment, too, of if you don't speak, who speaks and why, right? And, um, but it was a sleepless night or two. But then, being young and, and, uh, and fierce, um, I just decided to write, find out who everybody's supervisor was, all the way up to DC, and write, in, and, and write Al Gore, the incoming <laughs> vice president, letters, provided all the data, all the impacts, and also that I thought this was going to become a newly declared species at some point, right? And that, it was a, th that there were other suitable sites. While they caused the trucks to be on some of the main roads, you know, this was not a necessary impact. There were other sites that they had identified. Um, and so people from the, the head of the BLM from the DC actually came out and toured it and they did a little mitigation and, and uh, there were consequences. I'd had the BLM trucks and the trailer for four years Suddenly, I was basically, um, the trailer was going to be full. There were no trucks available the next year. The county commissioner was actually used his plow to close the road while I was behind it. <laughs> and had, and uh, to lengthen how the access to get to the lek, it was already quite a, quite a challenge. 
and stuff like that. I mean, people were mad, and at the time, you know, I can imagine many of you, you'd be like, ah, oh, this really is wrong, right? You know, there was, you know, suggestions of you might get hurt out there being a woman alone, tracking and stuff like that. The community was angry. And now I think with a little more maturity, I understand they felt betrayed. They had given me those trucks and that trailer and their support, and they had warned me <laughs> that, you know, this was not an issue that they wanted to deal with. And so they felt betrayed and they felt hurt. And it took a while. I'd say some of the relationships never repaired. Some did, right? This is the Chance Gulch area, and that's an UMTRA site. And this is uh, sh detailing that it was closed in, I think it is now, 1993, if I remember right, is what that says. So they moved all the mail tailings. They blew up the mountain. They did it all. Oh, yeah, they did it all. They uh, provided $100,000 in mitigation to fence some wet meadow areas to try to uh, keep cows out of them so that more sage grouse chicks elsewhere in the basin would grow. And the next year, the luck out there went from over from, um, it was down 60%, and it has never recovered. And so it just kept going down. It's a, that's a big impact out there. Was that luck actually under the stream, or was it just nearby? You could, you could hit it if you were a lot stronger softball tosser than I am. And it was a luck complex. That particular one was the biggest. It had the most males attending out of it. Yeah. So not just an eyesight. The males, while they were building it to these males, and, and people will talk about them being dumb, and I find that kind of offensive evolutionarily. They're one of the most successful species in the shrub steppe for hundreds of thousands of years. They don't deal well with our rate of change. Does that make sense? It's the, our rate of change. It's not that they can't deal with change and they're not well adapted. They're incredibly well adapted. They're a great canary in the, the minefield for the sagebrush. But those males, they danced on that hall road. <laughs> They didn't have any females show up, right? That's why their numbers kept going down each year after that. But they didn't. Trucks going by, they tried. Not very many. So, so the reason that, going back to thinking about um, the population level response, is that one of the things that Sage Grouse were teaching me as I radio tracked them and ran into these issues was why it was going to be a can of worms. They are very tied to the habitat, and they do not deal well with habitat loss, fragmentation, or degradation. That's the bottom line, right? And it is a habitat we have devalued. It's where we put our landfills and so forth, right? It's a place that we have devalued with time. So, so the overall consequences are is that currently Gunnison sage grouse are in seven populations. This population, Gunnison, has 85 to 95% of them all. They have less than 10% of their historic range. The population high male count, you can take the number of active lek areas and the number of high male count after the four counts of that season. And there, there were, these were leks that had uh, males that were in the 500s, 300s. You see it going down, but when you read about people talking about leveling off a bit, in the Gunnison Basin, it's, um, think about shifting baselines. That is true, but our number of active lek areas, because it's divided by it, is also reducing. So the level doesn't show the fact that we're losing leks, shows the average number of males per lek. And the statistics are much worse in other areas. That was the figure that we had talked about. Um, that we had from the thinking about lek areas from the Aldridge paper, the Apsil, the number of uh, lek areas going down. So just want to bring it back here. And I'm going to actually skip a little bit of talking about um, why lekking species have the problem that they do and give you case studies from the Heath hen and Atwater's prairie chickens. I'll just say it's not very pretty. So we'll just keep skipping forward for a second on that one and come back to a can of worms and what's in a name. All right, so why would a name have mattered? Why did he say we couldn't go there for this community? What did you learn in the last couple of weeks in 608? It becomes a species. Yeah. 
and then the Endangered Species Act, which can apply to populations, but not usually unless there's a species level issue, starts to become the strongest piece of legislation we have to protect the species and its habitat. And there was a lot of issues going on, right? So I'm not gonna go, it's always obnoxious when someone throws something like this on here and then passes by, but I know you know from the presentations that endangered is what it's defined as, what happens once a species is listed as endangered, critical habitat is designated for the Gunnison Sage Cross, 1.7 million acres of shrub steppe have been designated critical for the seven remaining populations. Um, and here's the key, the feds take over. It goes from state control, formally from, in this case, Colorado Park and Wildlife, to the Fish and Wildlife Service is in charge of the health of that species, okay? So the feds take over is, is part of what's scary. So knowing some of this by the time I, by the UMTRA thing and all that, you might think I'd rush to get it, call the species and, and all those type of things, but, but I didn't. Um, my PhD finished in 1994, and by 1995, I and others, you read about some of this from pretty much in every part of the range, started working on a collaborative, facilitated process to identify the issues, come up with actions, make a plan, took two and a half years, <laughs> eight hours every two weeks, and you saw the list of individuals, agencies, right, environmental organizations, ranching community, real estate, uh, real estate developers, and so forth, sitting around tables, county, city, and so forth, right, all this going on. We did that. We continued meeting for once a month for eight hours for more than a decade after that, working on implementing the plan, developing conservation priority areas, and I delayed publication of the, of the actual document to have it listed as a, as a new species because I by then understood it was a can of worms and that once that was going to happen, there probably would be um, a petition to put it listed as endangered. Okay, and so there were news articles starting to come out because everybody started to know this was about to happen. And I don't know if any of you remember Elian Gonzalez, the little kid. You know, the Cuban kid and the, the army, <laughs> the, you know, the rushing in and taking him back. And so they were comparing my sage grouse to Elian Gonzalez. It was so weird. All this was going on. This year, you know, the Senate majority could rest on sage grouse. There were articles for a few weeks about this. Come on, you know. It gets, this, it is a strange can of worms in terms of the social, environmental, economic things about it. So I waited to 2000, and with my co-authors, they agreed to wait. We published the genetic things carefully, built the case, and let it all fly loose. <laughs> and uh, by then, there were conservation plans from communities in place for every, every part of the species. Ah. All right, so that began the listing process. Recognized in 2000, a petition was turned in, on, and there was fights over whether the group that turned in the petition to list it versus the Fish and Life Service put it on the candidate species, but they put it on this candidate species list. It was listed as globally endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and then boom, in 2000, it was a candidate species category five. The highest listing, the 12 categories, is a two for species. You know, by 2003, it's a two. What's a candidate species from what you all learned? Did you learn about candidate species? Not so much. They meet all the requirements to be listed biologically as threatened or endangered, but there are higher priorities. It was a great trick. <laughs> and it started about 10 or 15 years ago, and basically it was a way for the Fish and Wildlife Service to say we don't have enough money, and they didn't. There's a lot of litigation and stuff going on, and, and uh, as you'll see, they're not very well funded. And they'd say, yeah, there's all these candidate species, but we've got to pay attention to the species that we already have to, dis to do the critical habitat for. So it's a black hole. There's no funding, there's no status, you kind of sit. Does that make sense? And that black hole became pretty serious by about this period. This is the number of listings per year. And you look at this graph and you think, oh, did our habitat get better? <laughs> Were species at less risk in North America? No, <laughs> they became candid species. There were more candid species than listed species. Um, one kind of political observation is 2001 was when uh, George Bush went into office through 2009. This becomes relevant, actually, 
for what's going to happen next for the Gunnison sage grouse. Those poor birds had the, had the challenge, and here's all the cases, and you've read a little bit about litigation and stuff with the ESA, so I'm going to skip through that. So things kept going. The range-wide planners, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Utah Parks and Wildlife did a big range-wide plan because they said the local plans were enough. They created 20% paper birds during that. If any of you are curious about that, I can talk to you. They did a new formula on how you calculate populations. So our populations rose 20% in one day. Fascinating. <laughs> they also found that the population would never go extinct, but they, if you look at Appendix F of that, they decided not to use the Gunnison sage grouse data for the minimum viable population model because it didn't look so good, and they <laughs> used a growing con contiguous population of greater sage grouse, but that's a different story. Um, listed as one of the 10 most endangered species, everybody's, you know, the same things you see right now. The community was tense, we've done so much, they're gonna list it in 2006. Rumors are it's gonna be endangered or threatened, and it comes out, and it's, it's con it says they're healthy. There's no issue. So even the most anti-listers are like, oh, you know, that is so weird. So you can imagine you want to grab that document. You're like, I want to see, you know, the decision document. Because it took them all the way off of the list. Are the candidate species, no protection. This is a healthy population. There are no issues. So I was kind of curious at that point in my life. So I, I get this uh, news release, and it says there's no evidence of threats. And there's a recent population trend study. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I guess I did get out of touch while I went to academic affairs for a couple of years. I must be missing some piece of research. And, uh, and then I start reading, and they're talking about a long-term analysis found that it's OK by a guy by the name of Garden. And the Gunnison Basin population has been stable, suggesting and this is that nice circular logic for critical thinkers in the room. If the population is stable, then grazing can't be an issue, right? Grazing can't be an issue because the population's stable. So I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Oil and gas is not going to be a problem right? Because it's stable. So everything's good. Everything's cool. You know, this is, you guys, that two and a half years of working on plans, what were you thinking? So, you know, I'm starting to think, who is Garden? <laughs> you know, I, at that stage in your career, you know everybody in your field. It's like, I've never heard of this person before. So then the, they, they have this on page 28. We asked, you know, since it wasn't a peer-reviewed thing, um, we had six outside people, since this isn't a published study. And they, you can see they're saying it's generally pretty favorable, right? You know, so it was good. We should all be good. So eventually I get those peer reviews and I get the study because of FOIAs and, and environmental groups. And they say things like this. from four of them. So maybe slightly different conclusion. So Garden is this poor statistical guy that they handed a data set to, and he made some assumptions. OK? He's not, there's not an evil figure of science hired, you know? He's, a, he's one of those people that it's like, oh, gosh, this is such a messy data set. So here's some of the assumptions we're going to make. To start with, I mentioned that. Uh, you know, the sage grouse had shrank to less than 10% of their range. So one assumption, if you read a study, is that all the sage grouse everywhere, um, they didn't disappear. That doesn't mean they disappear. They just move into that area. So that's one way that the population remains stable. With me so far? That there's no evidence that they didn't. Forget the site fidelity and the biology and the mountain ranges or whatever, or non-migratory species or, you know. They just <laughs> And then there were some inconvenient populations. Their numbers were so close to zero, three of the seven populations that he removed them from the analyses and then did a regression line. After, within each population, he found some challenges too. And so if some numbers just seemed, uh, seemed really weird and they'd gone down to zero, they were dropped. And so, you know, you drop enough things, you eventually end up with a straight line, right? Because you've taken, you know, the population is certainly not growing, so you're not going to get a line like that. It'll be that, because you've dropped everything off on that end. Does that make sense? So we would all say, for uh, ESA, best scientific stuff, something seems really, really wrong with this picture. 
And it was, you know, by 2007, they'd identified the political interference that was going on. If you guys are, are curious, she resigned. <laughs> and uh, you can actually get on the web and find her handwritten notes and, and the track changes, and it was as ugly as it gets. It went from um, the Fish and Life Service in the Region 6, you know, doing a, a huge document, much like what you've seen published, recommending endangered to it is a species that is no longer considered a species of any conservation. Okay, so that was, uh, that was special. <laughs> so, but it also had profound consequences. There was a lawsuit, and we've talked in 611 about when is it appropriate to litigate, right? When the system's not working, when you're feeling powerless, that type of thing. There are national groups in it, but for what you read in the paper, it's like, oh, these national groups, right? They're so, so troubling. But if you look carefully at who's in the lawsuit, there's local groups in it as well. There's a county that had a sage grouse population or has a sage grouse population in it. HICA has through the years supported its listing. Black County Audubon was in there. So, there's, so the idea that it's all about national environmentalists that you read in the papers is utterly untrue. It has never been true. It took them about three years to get it back to where it was 10 years ago, right? So you start the process again, because there's a process that goes on. So there was another lawsuit. And by then now, the number of candidate species was getting just out of control. And the number of lawsuits were out of control. So there was a big decision between the Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Interior, Department of Justice, and the main litigant, Center for Biological Diversity, that they would quit filing so many lawsuits if they would, in a five-year period, decide the fate of 757 candidate species. Gunnison sage grouse is one. Okay? A class action lawsuit. Kinda, <laughs> kinda. A species action lawsuit, right? And so, um, as of 2013, two years later, you had a chance to look at the document. It's proposed, is listed, as endangered. So, then you get really weird things. The political stuff is, is not over. Um, the House in June proposed a bill, excuse me, an act, and to uh, prevent the listing for 10 years. I'm actually not sure of the status of that. It would be interesting to know. So there's still that, you know, if you don't like the ESA, do something else. And so their idea would be, and in a sense, it's written in a thoughtful way, and it's very supported by many in our local community because it's saying give the local communities a chance. Do recognize that the local communities have been working on this since 1995, right? Who's chairman of the House? I don't. I actually don't know in that one, and I haven't read it in detail. I've just read that it would stop listing for 10 years. So population today. Um, those are broken down slightly different ways, but the, the main populations that are left, these are high male counts. Not so good in the other populations going on. Um, when you look at high male counts, depending on which formula you use, whether you use what all the rest of the nation used and the local working groups used, you get um, one way of calculating a population estimate, depending on the number of females and so forth. If you use one that came in the 2005 document, you get another. The overall estimate differs quite a bit. And I talked about a few extra birds showing up overnight on, on one of these. But you can tell these are the, the other populations are in dire struggle for their existence. They are very unlikely. 60 birds were moved to those populations. Some of those population numbers are from birds from the Gunnison Basin now. So, you know, you've heard the other side and you read some of the stuff and there's all these local efforts and you, you hear all that. I'm just going to say a couple more things about listing and finish this up. You know, it depends. Uh, people talk about throwing lots of money at species that are listed, but when you look at it, and I didn't look at the 2013 numbers, the actual budget is pretty tiny for the 2,000 or so species that are 2,000 plus species that are listed, and now as you saw, there's about 700 more that are lined up, right, across there. Um, it's not very much. And then you think about our priorities, and so one way that you can limit the effectiveness 
of recovery is to defund it. Absolutely. All sort of projects, county, city, private, yep, through the farm bill too. So that's actually, this is ESA budget. There's other budgets too that can influence them too. Farm bill budgets and so forth have uh, prioritization for, for uh, species if you're doing conservation action on your private. So I just smile at our priorities though. I love the military bands that come here in the summer. But it upsets me that we fund them at twice as, twice as much. I love handing out hot candy, but that's what the estimate is for this year. And I love my apps. So. <laughs> right? It's priorities. So I don't know about. There's not much funding for listing. It's politically, um, as you can see, it's challenging and so forth. So are the local groups going to be the solution? I, I can say it's hard to, the one challenge I've seen, and I'm going to end with this one, is that I quit participating in the local working group in about 2010. Okay, and that was after 15 years of it, chairing it, chairing the research subcommittee and so forth. Um, and then it also kind of folded into the, the county strategic committee that was a voting, that was a group that's not consensus, it's based on voting. And part of the reason is I was getting both, I probably need to use my time, my 20 or 30 hours a week for something a little bit more fruitful of what it was taking. And I was frustrated whenever some issue would come up and you can look through notes and look at some of these, whether it was the height of the grasses, right, that we would call for the land health assessments. And I would say, here's what the data show. So we have to have this height. They would go below it. Or if we were looking at shed antler hunting in the basin and the physical disturbance, and I'd spend lots of times at meetings saying, here's what gunnison sage grouse need. And then, and here's what's best for the shed antler hunters. And here's what's best for the, for the meal deer that you don't want to disturb. I would see the decisions go the wrong way. And when I say the wrong way, many, many of the decisions with data presented that are the 200 actions that people tout did not probably go, from my opinion as a scientist, far enough, okay? So I finally thought this is not the best use of my personal time. So complicated. So back to the very beginning, and, and uh, it is a can of worms. Having a name meant something, right? We wouldn't see the UMTRA stuff now. I honestly don't know if it should be listed. There are times that I have thought it should be. I've even written letters for emergency listing and droughts when we were really fighting over things like cheatgrass and not doing anything about that and populations went down by 30%. I am still, I am uncertain now because I, I hear all the threats of we're all gonna quit playing together if this happens. And that's not gonna help the grouse either, but I think it reminds me of what we've been trying to talk about here. That's when people, instead of looking at common interest, what's best for cattle and community and sage grouse, take a position. My community has taken the majority of position against listing as their ethic and their debate. So they're gonna be upset, right? Because they have taken a positional approach to negotiation rather than a common interest. And that's all I have. Thank you. I know that several of you have to leave. And I know, for example, Bill has uh, an important personal thing, so please leave. And if there's a few questions of those that are, no, seriously, I know, I didn't mean, I tried to finish about 10 minutes ago. Um, but if there's a few questions, I'm happy to answer it for those that remain. So if you leave, just quietly go, and I completely respect it. Um, formal, who's responsible for the, the actual uh, management of the species goes from the state to, since it's a land-based species, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, how so that, actively involved have they been in this whole thing? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I read about that in the paper and stuff too. Um, they were there in 1995. <laughs> and uh, one of them 
it's hard to explain how many hours he spent. They've had some changeover in the last three or four years. And I've heard that that changeover hasn't been, they don't have the history and the understanding then of the community's actions. And that has frustrated the community. But they have been a, a player since 1995. So the stuff about that is absolutely yeah. not true. interesting like back and forth in those editorials uh -huh. uh, and one of the main themes there was that the listing would either you know would kind of inhibit the collaboration uh -huh. that's going on on the ground now you know that's kind of like what Chris Dickey uh -huh. thinks has happened and then a listing would not stop any of that Yep. So what is, like, what's the answer, really? If, if the bird is listed as an endangered species, yep. what are the federal regulations that may or may not keep the strategic committee from doing what they've been doing? So I, I, um, I'm smiling because, you know, I've watched all this here's 2006 and now again. And um, two things I think are true. As long as we keep taking positions instead of common interest, I think the players that have done that strongly may not want to play much more. But over 50,000 acres of private land, 54,000 acres have been enrolled in Canada Conservation Agreements with assurances, which mean if it's listed, people won't be asked to, as endangered, um, they won't be asked to do additional things on their land. Okay? So there's been a lot of work done on that piece. If it's listed as threatened, the Fish and Life Service takes control and the federal agencies have to consult if they are doing actions that they think would harm the species or its habitat. Section 9 does not apply. Section 9, which is the take one that people have a lot of, uh, that's a good way to put it, there's a high sense of fear about, and sometimes some stories on both sides that probably aren't accurate. Um, Section 9 doesn't apply to threatened, it applies to endangered. If it's list listed as threatened, those Canada Conservation Agreements and Assurances are in place, and until someone voluntarily steps away from it, they are protected as long as they keep doing what they said that they were going to do within them. So I don't know if that quite answers it. I'm just saying that um, there's three things that could happen. It could be said that it's not an issue again. I, I hope not. The scientist in me just wants good, valid science used, right? You know, I just like that part. So I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but it could. They're at the point they have to do one or the other. They have to. The lawsuit requires that they either remove it again, or they say it's threatened, or they say it's endangered. If it's threatened, then some of the things of the ESA that people most fear are not the things that, that are, are uh, activated at that point. Um, so, in the, uh, the aftermath of the Atwater's Prairie Jay Games paper, you talked about how most private landowners are under the safe harbor agreement. What's the difference between that? Yeah. So the CCAA is, I call it, the 21st Century Safe Harbor Agreement. It's a quick translation. So it is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as part of Section 4 of the ESA. And it's, it does a very similar thing, and it provides even additional protections than what Safe Harbor initially did. In Safe Harbor, they could still have had further um, conservation measures implemented. If a CCAA, you cannot, is one of the, the differences. And I've read, though I'd love to get experts on this with policy and so forth, if any of you want to look into it, is that the CCAAs on ranching lands are also tied to their federal grazing permits. There's protection for the federal grazing permits as well. I've read that. I, I don't know the accuracy of that. If so, it's a pretty strong conservation um, measurement for local landowners that have enrolled in it uh, probably would alleviate some of the concerns. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Uh, yeah, Can I do Cass? I have two questions. The first one was, have you been called to testify on this? So there's some interesting stories that are probably not appropriate on camera. But I will say that I was the, one of the three peer reviewer of the 2013 document. They have to put it for outside review. 
so I'm still consulted in that way and asked if it was biologically um, accurate. The, the, the Federal Register uh, 2013 doing that one. And I will also say that all those emails and uh, some of the angry letters and things over things when I was a graduate student and afterwards have been used in courts as part of litigated processes. I have not myself had to appear in court to uh, describe why I wrote those the way that I did. But they have been used. Is that the first question, two questions? Uh, my second question was uh, from, from the perspective of working there now, mm -hmm. um, I would say since I started working there for about maybe like two years ago or so, we've made like an active choice to not talk about this as an issue because mm -hmm. it's so politically charged and a lot of that has to do with perhaps some other projects we were trying to collaborate on, let's say like the history of Mountain Bike Association or by some of these more user groups, which tend, in my impression, tend to be people that are speaking out of and people listening to some people that they could have their recognition ability. Would you say that that has been a general thing happening with other partners, or have you experienced a lot of, I know we talked about the rangers a lot, but has there been like a lot of lack of support from your traditional support based on environmentalists due to this reputation? So, I would say early on in our community, as it became formally in the bylaws, for example, the strategic committee, that their purpose was to prevent listing and that any individual or organization that came <coughs> out and said maybe we think listing might be beneficial um, had a lot of social and political challenges within the community. So whether it would be an environmental organization or an individual, the, the, uh, the tensions have gotten strong enough that saying that you think it might be positive or helpful has become harder and harder to say because then people will take that and say that means you're against grazing or development or this or that, right? That's the way the argument goes. And so instead of looking for common interest, um, there's been a lot of pressure over if you're for listing, you're against these other values of our community, including at the newspaper levels and so forth. Uh, Tyler and then Liz? Um. Because it's listed as a candidate species, does that generate resources for things like the strategic committee or even the strategy to be able to work on maybe have that um, organization for them? Or, and then if it's removed from that list, is that funding in any way for any sort of program? So, what my understanding was, which my, my greatest activity um, was ended by 2010, it doesn't mean I haven't been paying close attention to all the other things, but by 2010, what Fish and Wildlife Service did in 2000, let's say 2000, 2003, 20, 2006, and 2010, is that a candidate species does not get funding. That's in a sense the purpose of that category, is that they don't have the time or the money. That doesn't mean that it doesn't through partnering of grants and and through, um, there's been a lot of funding from other federal agencies to do actions to try to improve the habitat and prevent listing. But the Fish and Life Service doesn't, um, at that point, had, did not have any money for the cat species. So it certainly wouldn't, it, and, and they do for endangered or threatened, right. but, but not a ton as you saw. I mean, two more questions and then I'll, if anybody has, I'll do it individually. I feel like this could be personal and we don't have to answer it, but we keep talking about like a common interest between all the different uh, groups in the season. What do you think would be a common interest that all the groups could possibly get behind? I, I think that the ecosystem health of the shrub step and actions toward it help grazing, they help the sage grass. I think that looking for where development makes the most sense or doesn't, right, to help uh, reduce conflicts, those type of things. Um, I think, so that would be just one, I think with recreation, doing a, a plan, a larger recreation plan than site by site, saying we want this many uh, miles of trails, and then working together to say, okay, we understand there's all these issues, but where should they be? I think those type of approaches are incredibly healthy so it's so it's not so much personal. I mean, I 
But instead, so much became, we're going to do these actions to prevent listing. And uh, some of those actions probably um, didn't go far enough, in my opinion, or I would have continued to participate and provided data for, for individuals. Um, <coughs> I didn't read the entire panel that I So I might be, I might be like, <laughs> That and I, only I can't it. believe well, he I admitted that in public. <laughs> <laughs> so it seemed like there was some ambiguity in terms of the effects of grazing. Uh -huh. I saw your question. Like yeah. So given that um, it sounds like there's a biological ambiguity there, uh -huh. if the species is listed as endangered, how will the Fish and Wildlife Service enforce regulations based on grazing? Um, so I obviously don't know since I'm not them, so I can smile and duck the question. But I will address for a moment the ambiguity part. Is there's no, there's been quite a bit of research about what sage grouse females need and broods need. And there's been quite a bit of documentation about what our ecosystem health is. Okay? In terms of grass heights and mount of orbs and shrub st structure. There has been no direct landscape scale level grazing study that was started in, in 2010. And uh, it was finished in 2012 without any grazing actually being studied because of the sense that the sample sizes and the number of replicates needed, they did power analyses and all that, were so large that the community um, chose the strategic committee did not go forward with that. So we got over quite a bit of money from the state legislators to do a landscape scale grazing study. And by in 2010, but by 2012, that was shut down. Okay? So I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.